Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine here in the heart of Westminster. So is this the week that Rishi Sunak finally left the past behind? He's promised to stop the small boats, a controversial policy some would say was impossible to deliver, but it certainly generated debate. With that and his very own Brexit deal, he's been trying to step out of the shadow of Boris Johnson. But the former Prime Minister is never far from the headlines, with our latest Westminster Accounts investigation finding that Mr Johnson earned a cool £3.7 million this year, far more than any other MP. So we'll have more on that later on the show as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. On this matter, he talked about his legal background. He's just another lefty lawyer standing in our way. Things got pretty heated at Prime Minister's questions over the small boats policy. So what did the man accused of being a lefty lawyer make of it? After 13 years, small boat crossings higher than ever, claims unprocessed, the taxpayer paying for hotel rooms, criminal gangs running all the way, laughing to the bank. Well, on the programme today, we will deep dive into the small boats policy. Who is right? And we're going to have a top lineup of guests to do that with, including the Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick. We'll also be talking to the Shadow Attorney General, Emily Thornbury. And on International Women's Day, we are going to be speaking to Siobhan Haviland, the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, and much more besides, too, on the take. Good evening. Well, it's been a week so far dominated by the small boats row. Is it a policy that's workable or just another dividing line in the culture war? We'll be hearing from Labour and the government shortly, but let's start, shall we, with some of the best bits of the week so far. Prime Minister under fire this morning over his plans to tackle small boat crossings. The government want immigration to become a dividing line with Labour at the next election. They know this is traditional safe Tory ground that could sway votes. The trouble is, it's not just about talking tough on immigration, it's about delivering. If you come here illegally, you can't claim asylum. You can't benefit from our modern slavery protections. And you can't stay. This is their fifth Prime Minister, their sixth immigration plan, their seventh Home Secretary. Wow. And after all this time, all they offer is the same old gimmicks and empty promises. What's important is that we do need to take uh, compassionate but necessary and fair measures now, because there are people who are dying to try and get here. There's hundreds of thousands of people are taking part in demonstrations, rallies and events around the world to mark International Women's Day. Gender pay gap was 12% higher than it was in 2020. And can anyone on the government front bench please apologise to women for that increase this International Women's Day? Can I ask the Prime Minister to reconfirm that under his proposed new asylum laws, a woman who is sex trafficked to the UK on a small boat by a criminal gang will not be afforded protection under our modern slavery laws. Right. It's precisely because we want to target our resources and our compassion on the world's most vulnerable people that we need to get a grip of this system, make sure that we have control over our borders, make sure our, our system and resources are not overwhelmed. So well, as you can tell, the policy on migrants who cross the channel really dominated uh, Prime Minister's questions today. So that's the first thing I asked when I spoke to the Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, earlier this evening. Are you going to be able to stop the small boats? Well, that's our objective. We couldn't have been clearer in putting it as one of the five central promises of this government to stop the boats, secure our borders and bring fairness back to our asylum system. We're going to do everything in our power to achieve that. And ultimately, it will be for the public to decide at the next general election whether we've succeeded or not. But be in no doubt that the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary and I will do everything we can to achieve that goal. I'm just interested in listening to some of the language you're using there. It's your objective. You're going to do everything you can to achieve it. Not saying, yeah, we are going to stop the small boats. Well, we are going to, to stop the small boats and we will do everything that we can. It's a complex challenge. It would be wrong of me to pretend otherwise. That's why we're going to pull every lever at our disposal from the legislation that we've presented to Parliament this week to the diplomatic front that the Prime Minister is continuing 
tomorrow or Friday in, in Paris with President Macron, to the work that I'm doing with the security services and the police to toughen up our approach upstream to the criminal gangs. We We're going to do everything possible to resolve this. Are we going to be paying the French more? Well, we've already given them further funding in the arrangement that we reached at the end of last year, and that was for work that is now happening. We're seeing well, the fruits of that. Are we going to give them more money than what um, we've already well, pledged? Well, you'll have to wait and see what the Prime Minister agrees with President Macron at the end of the week. But Not ruling it out. What, what we're seeking to achieve is a number of things, one of which is more police officers, French officers on the beaches and the hinterland of them in northern France, so that we intercept as many of these boats as possible. And at the moment, the French are actually intercepting 50% of them, so that's meaningful to us. The more we can do on that front, the better. And we also want our intelligence services to be cooperating and working together in real time so that when we learn about what the criminal gangs are doing, we get that information to our French counterparts and they take action. We're very clear-eyed about how tough this is. We need to be robust against these criminal gangs because they're amongst the most organised and evil people in society today. I just want to have a look at some of the practicalities of this as well. So you're saying that if you enter the UK illegally, not through mm. legal routes, then you will not be able to claim asylum. So what then happens to those people? Like, you could I understand we've got return agreements with certain countries like Albania, but there's lots of other countries where many, many people come from that we don't. And like Syria, for example, 4,500 people arriving from Syria last year. You're not going to just pick up the phone to Assad, are you? Well, that's the reason why we need safe third countries like Rwanda. And we want to get that arrangement up and running as soon as possible. I was very pleased to see at the end of last year that the High Court upheld it as a legal policy. It's being appealed at the moment, so it'll be before the Court of Appeal next month. Assuming that that has a similar positive judgment for the government, then we'll operationalise that but as look, quickly as we can. Let's get real on Rwanda, right? 45,000 people, your figures, mm. um, crossing the channel last year in small boats. Rwanda initially agrees to take 200 people. No, that, they that, up that to 1,000 that's, that's uh, during that's not the correct, trial Sophie. period. That, that's not correct. I um, mean, not the only journalist to have, have said that, but the, the scheme with Rwanda is uncapped. So the Rwandan government, and we've spoken to them again this week, Rishi okay. Sunak spoke to uh, Paul Kagame, his opposite number, they're willing to take as many people as, it, as is required. Well, completely unlimited. So it's they'll un take 45,000 people to Rwanda if that's what you decide. It's an unlimited arrangement. We don't think it's going to take anything like What's that. What's your estimates, then, of the number of people who you're expecting to send to Rwanda? Well, we'll take as many... We'll send as many people as, as is required yeah, but you must to have, have the estimates. deterrent. You must have done No, because the, what, what, what we expect will happen is that this will break once and for all the people smugglers. Have you done estimates? Um, we've worked through scenarios, when, and what the Australian uh, experience shows is that within weeks, once it's clear that you will not spend uh, time in the UK, or in Australia in that case, uh, people will stop making the journey. So what I expect to see is that we will operationalise this policy. A very large number of people will need to go there, in the initial weeks and months. So what, what but then that it mean, will be very large? Well, it depends how many people are crossing the channel at that time. But if it requires thousands of people to be sent to Rwanda, then we will send thousands of people so to Rwanda. How many have been sent so far since uh, you launched the scheme in April? Well, well, none, because it's been caught well, in, that's my point, in, right? our, in our court. You know, well, that, makes, that makes the point pretty well, though, doesn't it? it I don't, I don't think you it, said that there are complex issues. Well, I don't think it does, the because... Legal, the, the legal ramifications of this, which are going to be extensive... Uh, well, the good news is, to look on the bright side, Sophie, is that the Court of Appeal is hearing the case and we expect that it will come to a similar judgment to the High Court, which said that the policy was lawful. If that's the case, then we should be able to get this policy up and running quite quickly and we will uh, remove as many people as is required to have the deterrent effect. And then I think you'll start to see the numbers crossing the channel fall very rapidly. And that's the key thing here, what are because you we want deterrents to be suffused throughout our approach so that we break the model of the people smuggling gangs. We don't want people to be risking their lives, spending their life savings at the behest of these evil criminals. We want to bring order and fairness back to the asylum system. What are you going to do with children? Well, what we've said is that if you come with your family, then you will be part of the scheme. So you'll be detained as a family group and you will then be removed either to your home country, if it's safe to do so, or to Rwanda so where you'll you, be cared for. So you could for. send families with young children to Rwanda, that is... Under... We, we could do. And, and let, let me just explain why that matters, because there's a, there's a difficult decision at the heart of this, which you're right to, to pick up on. But if we didn't do that 
then what we would see is people smuggling gangs preying upon families or people purporting to be families and specialising in bringing those people across the channel in small boats. And I don't want to see that. I, I don't want children to be at the behest of people smugglers. I, I've met children and families who have just arrived on our shores where we've literally saved their lives at sea. And as a parent, that is a shocking and horrible thing to see. And so by removing families, I think we'll have the deterrent effect that's required. So they stay in France, mm -hmm. which is obviously a safe place, and is where a family seeking protection should remain. But could also be sent, as you say, to third countries under the scheme. How about unaccompanied children? Uh, unaccompanied children will be given a short bridging leave, so they'll remain in the UK until they turn 18, and then at that point, they will be removed either back home if their home country is a safe place, or to a safe third country like Rwanda. Again, what we don't want to see is the UK being exploited by people smuggling gangs who prey upon children or those people who are purporting to be children. So I think that would be wrong. What, what happens to them in this bridging period then? Well, they would remain in the UK and they'd be cared for uh, by local authorities in the way that they are today for a short period. Remember that most of the minors that we receive as a country today who are unaccompanied are 16 or 17 year old males who are here mm. for mainly for work in the, in the black economy. What we would do is uh, look after them for that short period appropriately, and, you know, decently and compassionately, but then we would remove them afterwards because I think the alternative would be that the people smugglers would be bringing over children and also adults would be purporting to be children, which creates all sorts of safeguarding risks that we just don't want as a country. I just want to talk a little bit about um, the fact that many people would say there are no safe and legal routes or few safe and legal routes for people who are not from Ukraine, from Afghanistan, from Hong Kong, where we have this established mm. process to get into the country. They're desperate. This is why they're making the journey uh, in the first place. Uh, many from countries where they clearly have human rights uh, issues. They're not all economic right migrants, as you say. Now, I just want to play you what Chris Heaton-Harris told me on the programme on uh, Sunday uh, about safe and legal routes. I'm quite sure there'll be more safe and legal routes, and that's why, um, you know, and that's why we have them. And you're quite right; they've been proven to work. So he told me there will be more safe and legal routes. Is, is that right? Are you looking it, at opening it, it up? It is. The, what the bill says uh, is that we will create a new safe and legal route as a country, and that will be one which has a set quota. We will consult annually local authorities to see what capacity they have in terms of housing and school places to support those people appropriately. And then the Home Secretary of the day will come to Parliament and seek parliamentary approval for that. And I think that's quite a grown-up, mature way of handling this situation, where we, we do have a safe and legal route, but it's one which is rooted in the true capacity of local authorities so that we don't have people in hotels or clearly inappropriate accommodation. And we can set that number at a level that means we can look after people in the way that you or I or the British public would expect. I, I would, just having said that, take issue with the premise of the question, which is that the UK is somehow ungenerous. Oh, that's, uh, not, that's not what I'm well, saying. Well, actually, that's absolutely not what I'm last saying. Year, I, we... I didn't say that at all. What I'm saying is that there are safe and legal routes for people coming from com some countries and no safe and legal routes from other countries, which well, but, means well, that, you have But that's no... not quite true. For, for some countries, you're right to say the UK has been incredibly generous, like Ukraine, Hong Kong, Syria, Afghanistan, and, and quite rightly so, to the point that last year we issued more humanitarian visas than any year since the end of the Second World War, almost half a million since 2015. But there are already safe and legal routes from other countries. We have a resettlement scheme where we work with the UNHCR, uh, which is operating in those countries where there are conflicts or serious human rights abuses, which people can apply to. Uh, but, I, but I also don't think the UK can just offer support to anyone in any part of the world. It's right that we focus our finite resources on those places and people to whom we've got so that's, geographical, that's that moral, historical obligations. Yeah, that's the point. All countries that do that about. in the world. And I think that's that's completely understandable. Um, 
I just want to get your reaction to a tweet by Gary Lineker, uh, the uh, footballer who's taken issue with the scheme on moral grounds. Uh, he's said, there is no huge influx. We take far fewer refugees than other major European countries. This is just an immeasurably cruel policy directed at the most vulnerable people in language that is not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 30s, and I'm out of order. Well, firstly, on the language that he uses, I think that is inflammatory and wrong. You shouldn't throw around comparisons with the Nazis and 1930s Germany. He should choose his language carefully, just as politicians should do. And I suspect he's been in the public eye long enough to know exactly the kind of reaction that he was going to provoke. But on the policy, he's also wrong, because unlike Gary Lineker, I see every day in my job what the evil people smuggling gangs are actually doing. And, he is and right, though, what isn't they do is cruel and heartless. But what he's talking people about... are dying as a result of their activities. And the only way to break their business model is to implement a policy like this. What he's also talking about, though, is that we take fewer refugees than other major European countries. And actually, if you look at applications made in 2021 uh, per head, per 100,000 population, you know, we are quite a long way down at the list, aren't we? Um, Germany, France, Switzerland, Netherlands, Spain... Well, it depends how you, how you look at the figures. I mean, if you look at the Homes for Ukraine scheme, that is, yeah, but that's not, that's, that is that's, twice the size yeah, of the French equivalent. You're just, you're just using one example of just people well, from Ukraine, pretty, which is about the overall refugees. It's a, it's a pretty here. significant scheme. You're talking about... You yeah, know, but I'm talking about overall, I'm talking about people. overall refugee well, uh, here and you're well, completely you, deciding well, okay, to answer let, a completely let, different let me answer an, Let me answer in a different way, then. If you look at the countries who take people on safe and legal routes, organised by the UNHCR, we are the fourth largest recipient of those individuals of any Again, developed country in the, figures, in, in the world. You're not looking at overall figures, you're looking at, at Well, I'm looking at, at, at countries... Things. In terms of how would you measure a country's willingness to embrace those people who are in greatest need in but the world. He's talking, he's, you only have to look at the schemes that we've created. We take far fewer refugees than other ma well, major well, European countries. Well, I, I don't think that's correct. I mean, obviously, there are countries like Poland whose borders, you know, their position within Europe means that inevitably very large numbers of people have crossed and they've welcomed them in a compassionate manner. Okay. But the schemes that we have put forward in recent years are incredibly generous and compassionate, and, and that will always continue. You're still going to watch Match of the Day? Yeah, of course I will. I like watching Gary Lineker. I just don't always enjoy his tweets and think he should choose his language more carefully. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Robert Jemrick there, the Immigration Minister. Well, let's get Labour's take uh, now, shall, shall we, on the small boats policy and also uh, on uh, Gary Lineker too, who's been generating quite a lot of uh, headlines uh, today. I spoke to the uh, Shadow Attorney General, Emily Thornbury. I want to talk to you about the government's policy on small boats. It's very sure. clear. They say that they want to try and stop the small boats by saying anyone who enters the UK illegally won't be able to make a claim for asylum. Would a Labour government keep that policy? We don't think it works. I mean, we want to stop the small boats as well. It's just that we don't just want to talk tough. We actually want to take some action. And Suella Braverman has said, you know, that people are fed up with tough talk and no action. And she's right. And that, you know, this legislation that they're trying to pass is very similar to the legislation they tried nine months ago, and that didn't work. You know, like the legislation from nine months ago, they identified 18,000 people who they said had no right to be in the UK. And, how, oh, and in the last year, how many of them have they sent back? 21. You know, this is just rhetoric, this is posturing, and it's not a plan so, for stopping the small boats. I'm just trying to work out, do you yeah. object to the government's policy purely on practical grounds, because you don't think it will work, or do you object to it on moral grounds too, on principle? I think, first, first and foremost, we want to stop the small boats and we want to take action that's going to work. We think that it is wrong that the government is trying to posture. We are concerned but about just, some of the language that on, they use. I think we could agree everyone wants to yeah. stop the small boats, but the principle that if you enter the UK illegally, you shouldn't be able to claim asylum. Do you agree with that? Well, I think our concern is that there will be, amongst those people, some people who are genuine refugees, and there will be people who are taking the mickey. And what we should be doing is making decisions and making decisions fast. Essentially, we think that we should have a, a firm, fair and fast immigration and asylum system. But instead, what we've got is we've got hotels clogged up. We've got them wanting to open up you know, all kinds of camps and just lock people up in them. If you were, let's say, a... Um, 
uh, an interpreter for the army in Afghanistan. You know, the people who have been able to come out and get asylum have already gone. You know, the helicopters have gone, the planes have gone, people are now stuck. And they've been told by the government to make their way to Britain and claim asylum. But there isn't a way legally of coming to Britain as an Afghan now. Well, that's so, true. There, was a, there is an Afghanistan resettlement. Yeah, yeah. And it's, there, and it's there finished. Is, there is. No, no, no. It's finished. It's not possible to get... I mean, OK, so so even if... So, so yes, you'd be able... Once you claim it, then you can claim... At, but, like, where do you do it and how do you do it? The government has said, make your way here. So if you did make your way here illegally and then claim through the system, I want that they go, no, no, sorry, you've come illegally. We can't even process your claim. Afga in Afghanistan, there is a legal route to claim asylum in the you UK. You cannot though. get from Afghanistan to the UK legally. So you have to, I mean, there aren't any flights. You can't get there. So you have to go, you have to make your own way to the UK. But not for Afghanistan, though. There is a, there is a resettlement uh, programme yeah, for Afghanistan. But, they, but the government has said that people should make their way. Because they, there I has been. That, except from other countries, Syria, for example, yeah. Iran, Iraq. But for Afghanistan, there is a, I mean, you, you can argue about the figures and the fact that very few people have come under it, but there is a route. A large number of people came, right? A large number of people came, but then there was a cut-off. And now, I mean, I have a constituent who's, who went back to get his wife and now can't get back to Britain because there aren't any flights, and so he's having to take her, you know, over into Pakistan and then was hoping to try to get the two of them into the UK. But whether they're able to get out of Afghanistan into Pakistan is a big question, you know, particularly given that he has a British passport. It's, I mean, the whole thing is really very difficult. And you slip into, you know, illegally travelling very easily, very quickly, in order to try to get asylum, which is what people are doing. Anyway, this is, this is a long aside. The point is this, right, is that there will be people amongst those who are arriving in small boats who are genuine refugees. And the government's policy now will be, we don't care, you've come illegally, we will put you into a camp and you will have no rights and we will... Well, I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, because they can't send anybody back anywhere. So what, what are they going to do with all these people? And they don't answer that. What they should be working on is they should be working on a system whereby they can return people and coming up with some agreements with other countries... Which is so what they, they say return. they are doing. Well, they're not. You know, I mean, Priti Patel was banned from France, if you remember, because of the remarks that she'd made. They were having discussions and they said, well, we're not going to have your home secretary. They had, you know, the broken, the broken immigration and asylum system is the fault of the government. And the government have been in power for 13 years and they have broken it. Um, Gary Lineker has, the football uh, presenter, has criticised the policy as immeasurably cruel. Do you think it's appropriate for someone who works at the BBC, who accepts money from the licensed pair, to use their platform to make political statements? Look, I know that Gary Lineker feels very strongly about this issue, and he has introduced... I mean, he's brought um, refugees into his home, he campaigns on this issue. I think some of the language that Gary Lineker has used in the last 24 hours has been really very unfortunate, and I wouldn't have used some of the... You're talking about the comparison to Germany yeah, and the, the Nazis. Yeah, the Nazis, yeah. I, don't, I just think that there is a special place in hell for the Nazis and for the Holocaust. I don't think that you should be making comparisons. Um, so I wouldn't have said that. I think that he went too far. But what the BBC does about it is, frankly, not my business. It's not for me to tell the BBC what they do. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, it'll be up to them if they want to do anything about it. But otherwise, I'm sure he will continue to say what he thinks. Yeah, it certainly seems that he doesn't tend to do that. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about anti-Semitism, uh, mm. because Luciana Berger uh, returned to the Labour Party uh, four years after stepping down, accusing the party of anti-Semitism yeah. under Jeremy Corbyn. Um, Keir Starmer apologised for what he described as her intolerable and unacceptable experience. Do you agree that she had an unacceptable experience? Yeah. I, I just wonder, because obviously both you and Keir Starmer were in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet, you know, you to buy him, you campaigned for him, you tried to get him elected. Uh, you also said, said at the time that you didn't believe that Jeremy Corbyn was anti-Semitic. Do you think that by being in that shadow cabinet, you were part of the problem? No, I don't. I think that, I mean, I remember both Keir and I were constantly pushing, you know, to make sure that we, we, we adopted the international definition of anti-Semitism. You know, I know that both of us pushed that and I know that behind the scenes we campaigned on it, we, we did everything we could to ensure and eventually succeeded in making sure that the Labour Party ex accepted that was the standard. You know, we raised the issue frequently in Shadow Cabinet and 
we don't normally talk about what happens in shadow cabinet, but I mean, I think that enough time has gone by to be able to tell you that. It's, you know, he knows and both, and I know that he did too, that the two of us would raise it frequently and make sure that we kept pushing it. We kept saying, what's happened to the disciplinary process? We want to have a report. When are we going to have a report? All of these things happened and, and making sure that we continue to push it was a very important part. You know, there are... If you felt like that... Yes. Why did you then campaign for Jeremy Corbyn to become Prime Minister? Wouldn't that be a red line for you? I think that... I think that it was right for us to be pushing that and I think that it was right for us to try to ensure that the party was... was dealt with that problem. You know, we did fail, but we did try. Um, I think that a Labour government is always better than a Conservative government. I believe that to the bottom of my soul. Uh, that I think that a Labour government is better. I think that, that the way Jeremy led Even the... Even an anti-Semitic one. The way that Jeremy led the Labour Party was, was one whereby he would... He gave us quite a lot of, of freedom to be able to develop our own briefs. And I was Shadow Foreign Secretary at the time. And I don't believe that anyone can say that our foreign policy was in any way anti-Semitic. Um, and I made a speech at a Labour Party conference. Um, and there had been before me somebody speaking about the Palestinian cause. And to a sea of Palestinian flags, I said that there were people who criticised Israel in a way that cloaked their deeply felt anti-Semitism and that that was a scourge and that we had to do something about it and we must root it out to the Labour Party. And I got a standing ovation because the vast majority of people in the Labour Party identified that there was a problem and wanted it to be dealt with. Um, I am keen, as today is International Women's Day, mm. uh, to talk to you a bit about that, uh, just to end the interview as well. Is there one issue... I mean, the thing is, there's so many issues, aren't there, that you could decide yeah. to pick, but I just yeah. wonder if there's one issue that you, know, you feel strongly about that's personal to you that you think we should be focusing on today? Well, yeah, there are lots. That's the trouble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think violence against women and girls is a really important issue. I think that it impinges on all our lives um, and is, it, it intimidates us and, and, uh, and limits what we can do because of a fear. Um, but I also think that, you know, 50 years after the Equal Pay Act, we still don't have equal pay. How can it be that women still get 80% of the pay that men get. I mean, this is a fact, you know, women working full time, we're still getting 80%. Why is that? And it's partly, I think, because, you know, when Barbara Castle first introduced the legislation, it was like, if two people are doing the same job, then they should both be paid the same. And that was kind of simple. But we've now got into much more complex areas. Mm -hmm. So we've got things like, like, um, the jobs may be slightly different, mm. but they and therefore are paid differently. And of course, it's always the man who's paid more. Mm. There's secrecy around the, the amount of money that people are paid. It's really difficult to take your case to a tribunal. It's very difficult to kind of say, you know, my job is the, is the same or similar to this person's job, and to get a comparison. Also, how is much we value difficult. classic women's work as well. And right? then. There is, the, there is the difference in... So, you know, we saw this during the pandemic, didn't we? We saw, actually, I think it gave us an opportunity to look again at what jobs we really value. Mm. <laughs> Who are the real core workers? Who are the core employees? And very often they are women doing caring roles, but they are the ones who are paid the least. Yeah. Have you ever felt that you've been paid unequally in your um, career? Oh, that's a good question. Um... Yes, I think there have been times when I have not been paid the same. That's interesting. Um, yeah, no, I think so. Name any names? So. Um, no, I mean, I think that there were times when I would do... Um, certain, when, I was a, when I was a lawyer, there was certain work that I would be pushed towards that would be paid less mm -hmm. than the work that, that, uh, that men on the whole did. And then I started doing it, and I turned up and I would be the only one doing... So fraud cases, for example. Mm -hmm. I used to be the only woman ever doing fraud cases, and they were paid much better than the other type of criminal defence work mm -hmm. that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were all these guys in double-breasted suits and me. Mm -hmm. um, and that was unusual, mm -hmm. you know, but they had kind of cornered the market... Although we were all doing criminal defence work, you know, there were certain parts of, the, of, of, of crime that, that men would do and women wouldn't. Mm, really interesting. Um, mm. Thanks very much for coming on the programme today. Thank Not you. at all. We'll be talking more about International Women's Day later on the programme, but next up we are going to be talking to Sam Coates about his latest Westminster accounts investigation.
Welcome back to Westminster. A Sky News investigation can tonight reveal the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson has earned 85% of all the outside earnings generated by MPs this year. Our Deputy Political Editor Sam Coates has the latest edition of the Westminster accounts. The most famous face in British politics. This week, six months since Boris Johnson was forced to leave number 10. In resignation, he promised the nation there were good times ahead. Even if things can sometimes seem dark now, our future together is golden. For him, it certainly has been. Here are the MPs who have declared the most in outside earnings so far in this parliament. And at the top, it's not even close. Nearly £5 million in earnings for Boris Johnson. Almost all of that earned in the six short months since he departed Downing Street. And £22 million, now that's the total amount of money all 650 MPs have declared on top of their £84,000 a year salary since the last election in December 2019. And here are the MPs that have registered the most in outside income so far in 2023. So we've got the data for just under two months of earnings. Now, understandably, many of these numbers are quite small, but one man clearly is having a very good year, financially at least. The former Prime Minister has registered over £3.7 million in extra income just since the turn of the year. He's been paid over £500,000 by publisher HarperCollins for a book that's yet to be published and nearly £2.5 million from an agency which the former Prime Minister describes as an advance for speaking engagements. Now, the sheer scale of Boris Johnson's earnings are really rather extraordinary. So look at this. £4.4 million is the total sum of outside earnings made by all 650 MPs so far in 2023. And of that figure, Boris Johnson alone has earned 85% of the cash. The highly paid speaking gigs have spanned Singapore, New York and Mumbai, and now Westminster. Not Parliament, this a conference just down the road. Boris Johnson giving his first public reaction to Rishi Sunak's Brexit deal and what just happens to be a very lucrative platform. Boris Johnson, how much are they paying you to pronounce at the brand finance conference? Why aren't you doing this in Parliament? Uxbridge in West London is where Boris Johnson has made his political home. This is not a safe seat. Some constituents far from happy. Do you think he should stand again? And if you if he did, would you vote for him? Um, no, I don't think I'd vote for him again. Um, he's making a lot of money, like you say, doing other things. So yes, yeah, step down. I'm okay with that, but I wanted him to focus more on his constituency. I'm here working six days a week, but I never see him. Being slung out of office by his own party doesn't appear to have dented Boris Johnson's earning power. But is this the golden future he dreamed of? Sam Coates, Sky News. Well, let's chat to uh, Sam a little bit more now, uh, shall we, about his report. Um, Sam, I remember sort of talking to you about the whole Westminster Accounts project and one of the most interesting things about it, or useful things, is the fact that you can compare other MPs against each other. And I guess what's astonishing here is how much of an outlier Boris Johnson really is. That's right. One of the things that the Westminster Account tool does, and by the way, you can look at it yourself on the Sky News app, is allow you to compare and also do leaderboards. And you actually saw one of the leaderboards in that film just there, lists all of the top earners. And, and what's significant is that we've got a new name at the top. In January, it was Theresa May. Now, it's Boris Johnson by quite some way. Mm. I mean, uh, Theresa May's been left quite, quite, quite a long way behind. Now... It's very, very important to stress that Boris Johnson's done nothing against any rules. He's uh, declared everything properly. But as with Boris Johnson so often, what he's done is taken the rules and really sort of stretched them to the furthest extent that you can take it. It's been something he's done all his career. Um, and I think it is one of those issues where people have very strong views. Some people don't think it's a particular issue. If you can get that money, then fine. Others uh, think that that's not right. But it does test the boundaries. And it also raises questions about whether or not just the sheer extent of this doesn't raise questions about whether or not MPs can better police themselves. And I was just winding back a little bit through history because it was in November 2021 that the then Prime Minister actually suggested curbs. And I've got the letter from Boris Johnson here. It was in the middle of another scandal. That one was to do with Owen Paterson. And the Prime Minister of the day wrote uh, that um, outside activity should be undertaken within reasonable limits. Um, shouldn't prevent uh, MPs from fully, out, fully carrying out a range 
of uh, duties and th this recommendation uh, formed the basis of a viable approach. That was what Boris Johnson suggested then, but fast forward a couple of years and the fact that he then had to abandon those reforms is now benefiting himself. I wonder what the Boris Johnson of that letter would make of the current Boris Johnson's uh, earnings. Uh, Dealing with the problem on the, on the doorstep at the moment, yeah, as ever. <laughs> uh, Sam, thanks very much for talking us through that. Uh, now, you can... There you are. Oh, where are we? Here. No, here. Sorry. Here we go. <laughs> Apologies for that. Look in the right place. Always useful. Uh, you can find out more about the Westminster Accounts uh, project, which is between Sky News and Tortoise Meter Media, and use our special online tool as well by visiting skynews.com or on the Sky News app. You're watching The Take. We're live in Westminster for you. It's International Women's Day, so we're going to be speaking to a voice from business about how women with family responsibilities are being denied promotion and career progression. Hello, welcome back to Westminster. You're watching The Take. Now, today is International Women's Day and I've been really keen to do something about it on the programme to mark it. And we saw a really interesting piece of research from the British Chambers of Commerce. They've been looking at the impact of childcare and also the menopause on women's careers. And they say, the women that they've spoken to say they're missing out on promotion because they take time off for um, some of these uh, reasons disproportionately. Uh, for the men, but also, of course, the impact that childcare has on their career too. I've been speaking to Siobhan Haviland, who is the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce. I should comment, you are dressed absolutely resplendently uh, tonight. <laughs> You've been at an event, that's, have you? Uh, thank you, I have. I was at the Palace at lunchtime uh, with the Queen Consort. I'm a trustee of Women of the World and she is the patron, so we had a lovely uh, hour in the Long Gallery with her um, talking about hopefully getting to gender equality. Amazing. Uh, and you've got some research out today, uh, haven't you? Just explain what, what does it show? Yeah. So this is the first time the British Chambers of Commerce have done this research. 4,000 respondents, both men and women, looking at their career development. Um, so really interesting findings. Uh, two thirds of women still say that they have been impacted in their career journey through childcare responsibilities. Um, over 80% of people don't believe there's enough support for more general caring uh, responsibilities and 50% of women are worried about how menopause is going to impact them. So it's huge, still, isn't it? I mean, the menopause, it, it feels like this is an issue that we're only really recently starting to talk about. I mean, I certainly feel that as a woman, like that it's something that it's really only become on the national conscience, I mean, other than the people going through it or who have gone through it, quite recently. Yeah, definitely. I mean, having been in business and in government, it's really only been the last, I would say, maximum five years yeah. where you, you see people talking about it and we see much more through our chamber network, them talking about it because it's what businesses want to talk about and, and obviously women and men, of mm -hmm. course. Um, and, you know, there's the whole piece around understanding, understanding how it impacts people, doesn't impact everyone, of course, mm -hmm. uh, training around that, supporting, and then having to sort of think about how you can work in flexibility around helping people are go who are going through that. But it's just great that people are talking about mm. it, so people begin to understand it's something they need to learn about. And then childcare as well is such a huge thing. I mean, it should be for both parents, obviously, but... In reality, it's often women whose careers are impacted by this, and that, I guess, is what your research has, has found. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. And uh, what we found is that impact is because it's very hard for women to find affordable childcare. You have to be earning a certain salary before it's really worth you, you know, going back to work. So it's about affordable childcare, it's about accessible childcare, because it's also quite hard to find if you can find it. So, you know, what we want to do is say, We've looked at all these issues. You know, these aren't there aren't quick fixes. Mm -hmm. We want to have a sort of three-year campaign where we can put together a, an equity commission. We can say, okay, let's bring employers together with government, with, with with employment experts. What are the policies that government can put in place? What are the best practice that that business can put in place? And how can we really move the needle? And it's interesting that you said that men as well as women. Did you find a bit of a 
gender gap, shall we say, on whether or not people felt that childcare and having kids had impacted their careers? It was definitely more women who saw an impact on their career when it came to childcare than men. In fact, the gap really closed when it came to more ge general caring responsibilities, mm. which you, know, you assume are sort of probably parents. Elderly relatives. Yeah, or, yeah. and families and friends. Mm. Um, there was a much, you know, there were... 86% of people saying there's not enough support mm. around that general caring piece. Um, and, you know, you hear from women more and more who probably have both childcare responsibilities and mm. caring for parents at the same time, so that's a, du a double impact. Um, but, you know, we've got the budget next week. Yeah, what are you hoping to see in it, then? So, we are, you know, there's... 1.1 million open roles in the UK. 50% of our businesses say they are struggling to recruit people. So, you know, Chancellor, we really want to look at ways of bringing people back into the workforce. About 1.7 million people don't work because of caring responsibilities. 86% of them are women. Mm. Now, of course, not wow. all of them want to work, but actually, you know, if you can have access to affordable childcare, yeah. you have that option. So what we want to see is the Chancellor look at things like the current tax-free allowance of £2,000. He could raise that. He could work in other ways of using the tax system mm -hmm. to help couples mm -hmm. uh, with tax, you know, childcare get into tax, or if you're self-employed, for example, through business expenses. So... We would love to see him act on childcare uh, next week. Um, I'm going to ask a bit of a personal question, because you're a mother as well, and I know that we've sort of spoken a bit about this um, off-camera. Do you feel that your career has been impacted by having kids? So, my kids are a little bit older now, but, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was in a really privileged position that by the time I came to have children, I was sort of well-paid enough that I mm. could afford childcare and go back to work, both of them after about nine months. But I definitely saw my salary plateau yeah. during those probably four or five years. Yeah. And that was a point at which my husband's salary overtook mine. Mm. And there's often at these critical moments in your career, right? When you're just getting, like you say, yeah. you just got to a certain level, you're about, you've got the experience, and then yeah. suddenly you're, like you say, kind of plateauing. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually when, maybe when, the, when your partner's earning more than it mm. generally was falls on you to take the calls from uh, the school when yeah. something's gone, gone wrong. Um, you know, I'm very lucky to have a very supportive husband, but, yeah, yeah it's, it's always a juggle, exactly isn't it? how it is, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I remember getting the advice that, you know, if you manage to kind of stand still in your career when you've got <laughs> children under five, then that's an achievement in itself. Yeah, which is not what we want in our labour force, is it? You know, it's not, it is great, of course, for women who want to go back to work, but it's about the economy. Yeah. It's about that sort of wasted talent that could be back in our workforce that at the moment we really, really need. So how do we support those women who want to go back to work to be able to do what they want to do and yeah. give back to the economy? And also good childcare, I guess, as well, right? Not just any old childcare, but childcare that is actually somewhere that you might feel comfortable leaving your children and not feel the kind of guilt that all mothers and fathers uh, tend to yeah, feel. Yeah, absolutely right. A, a choice of types of childcare that suits as well. You probably work flexibly, you know, you might work different hours, different night shift, day shift, you know. Mm -hmm. We need options for childcare, absolutely. Uh, really great to have you on the programme. Thanks very much for coming in. Thank Happy you very much. Women's Day. You too. Welcome back. We've had lots of takes this evening and for our very final take, we're joined by our Chief Political Correspondent, John Craig. And you've got a couple of news stories to bring us up to date with. The first is about lobbying, right? A couple of breaking stories, really, which uh, may well develop tomorrow. Uh, the first one is from the Telegraph's lockdown files, but it's not about Matt Hancock. <laughs> it's about another ex-minister, that's Steve Bryan. Now, he was a junior minister at health under Jeremy Hunt, but crucially, he now chairs the Health Select Committee and he has been uh, found out, if you like, by the uh, what's leaked WhatsApps because he was lobbying for a firm that was paying him £1,600 a month. It's a, it's a company called Remedium. It's a recruitment company. And he was trying to persuade the NHS to hire people through this firm. A WhatsApp said, long story short, I've been trying for months to help the NHS through a company I'm connected with. He sent that to uh, Michael Gove and to Simon Stevens, the boss of NHS uh, England. Now, the Liberal Democrats say he should stand down as chairman of that select committee, the Health Select Committee. This is Daisy Cooper, their health spokesperson. Yet another Conservative scandal, she says. 
Steve Bryan should immediately step down from the Health Select Committee and the PM should launch an independent investigation into this damning evidence. Bryan cannot be in post while these allegations hang over his head. Well, he says he's done nothing wrong. He told The Telegraph, actually, um, this was about responding in the national interest to an urgent public call from ministers in the NHS in a national crisis. Now, we're very, very nearly out of time, uh, but Boris Johnson has waded into the Dominic Raab case. This is also in uh, the Daily Telegraph. Uh, Boris Johnson warned Dominic Raab about his conduct and gave evidence to the bullying investigation. Now, Mr Johnson's been terribly busy earning all that money that Sam was talking about, but he found time, we learned, to talk to Adam Colley, KC, who's uh, carrying out that bullying inquiry. You'll remember you interviewed Dominic Raab. He said if he was found guilty, he'd quit. Yes. Well, it's claimed that Boris Johnson warned him about his conduct. Not, Not that helpful. very helpful. Not very helpful. <laughs> uh, we are out of time. Uh, that's it for the take. We'll be back next week and every week. Men's at... 9pm.